for our next segment, we have Lieutenant Steve Rogers joining us uh, in just a minute via Skype. Um, he's a Trump 2020 advisory board member. And in studio, uh, we have Nate Lerner joining us. He's co-founder of Draft Beto. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Beto O'Rourke and his meteoric rise on the national stage. It's been very interesting. I think that, uh, you know, I haven't heard much about him as it relates to foreign policy. And so if he were here, if, if Beto were here, I would ask him a lot about what he thought about this Steve Mattis, um, General Mattis resignation. Um, and just as we're transitioning, can we put that tweet up from President Trump about uh, General Mattis retiring, just because I think it's really important. President Trump says, General Jim Mattis will be retiring with distinction at the end of February, having served my administration as Secretary of Defense for the past two years. During Jim's tenure, tremendous progress has been made, especially with respect to the purchase of new fighting equipment. Uh, let's put the second tweet up. <laughs> Equipment. General Mattis was a great help to me in getting allies and other countries to pay their share of military ob obligations. A new Secretary of Defense will be named shortly. I think greatly thank Jim for his advice, service. Um, and I just called him Steve, but his name's Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, so uh, very, very interesting development, um, just as we're waiting here for our Skype guest with General Mattis retiring. And here's here's what's funny is because I hear so many Democrats who are criticizing the president for Mattis leaving when Mattis is apparently leaving for the, tr the troops being pulled out of Syria, which to me is something the Democrats like, right? Well, no. If you actually read uh, General Mattis's resignation letter, he actually doesn't speak so much about Syria, but actually speaks more to the treatment and how the administration was approaching our allies. And it really put a focus on what and how should we communicate with our allies. And he, the one thing that the line that really stuck out was that we have a, a duty as Americans, one of the greatest countries in the world, to make sure that we align and protect and work with our allies. So I think there was a question about how President Trump was talking and negotiating for allies that General Mattis disagreed with, and I think many of the generals of NATO also disagreed with. And I think that is what was disconcerting, and it seems there's been more of a ripple on the Republican side than actually the Democratic side. Well, uh, yeah, but McConnell has issued a letter that's echoed a lot of what Mattis was saying. But um, we, we're going to continue. Let's pa pause this table list right now and move mm -hmm. to our Beto conversation because we do have our Skype guest ready. You there, Steve? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. And Nate, welcome to you here in studio. Yeah. Nate, can you tell us about the future of the Democratic Party post midterms and how Beto O'Rourke fits into the future? Well, I think <clears throat> our future is extremely bright, um, as is Beto's. Uh, we had a historic victory in the midterms. We received more votes than any other party um, in the history of midterm elections. I believe it was you know, over 60, 60 million at this point. Um, so it's you know extremely exciting to, to be a part of right now, how the Democrats are growing. Um, and I think where Beto fits in is, is the energy he was able to create in Texas is now expanding nationwide. Um, you know, our organization is based in New York. A lot of our leadership team is spread out across the country, and it's very reflective of the kind of grassroots energy that's building for him this early, which is really unheard of. So do you, do you think maybe it's peaking a little too early? Because something I've already seen on Twitter, and it's probably coming from the left of, uh, of Beto, is attacking some of his voting records, where they said that he had some votes that went with Trump or with um, against the ACA and a couple other things. It seems that... As usual, Democrats have to fall in love where Republicans <clears throat> fall in line. And it does seem that some people are saying that he is not the perfect Democratic candidate, such as, in some people's views, like a Bernie Sanders. Right. Well, I think you know, there's, there's no perfect Democratic candidate, um, even though we have a great field. And I'm really excited to see uh, all the candidates we have on display. They have a really strong bench. None of them are perfect. You can nitpick all their records, all the things they've said at some point. Um, is not going to fall in line with everything that everyone believes. Um, but when you look at Beto's ability to unify the base and to mm. also bring in new voters, that's really unparalleled. And we don't see that in any other candidate right now. And it really does, is very reminiscent of John F. Kennedy and even Barack Obama to an extent, because he's just so strong when it comes to connecting with voters mm. from all backgrounds, from all across the country, from all different areas. And that's really what the party needs right now. You know, our progressive base is fired up. That's great. We want them engaged. We want them involved. They're, they're definitely excited about Beto. But there's also, you know, less involved voters who are less engaged who we need to turn out and who did not turn out in 2016 is a big reason why we lost. 
and then also getting those Obama Trump voters back as well. And I think Beto is certainly the right right man for the job. Well, uh, speaking of of Trump, uh, let's bring Stephen since he is on President Trump's 2020 advisory committee. Uh, you just heard from Nate saying that he's trying to attract and pull over some of those uh, you know Bernie Trump voters. Are you going to let that happen? I mean, what's what's the strategy for someone who uh, I mean, he raised thirty eight million dollars. He obviously has uh, tremendous uh, chops for raising money. Um, what are you scared of better work? To begin with, I'm watching history repeat itself back during the uh, days of Ronald Reagan. I remember President Reagan saying, who was a Democrat, by the way, uh, he said, I did not leave the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party left me. And this is exactly what's happening again. The Democrat Party is now becoming a socialist party. It's a party that is going to uh, collapse. There are millions of conservative Democrats that are now very weary of the direction the Democrat Party is going in. And so we're going to see we're going to see a reversal of what happened during this last congressional elections rather quickly. I could tell you that with regard to the strategy that President Trump is going to use, be the same strategy we used when he originally ran for office. We do see uh, millions of people are beginning to now scratch their heads. And I'm talking about Democrats who are conservative leaning now and independents about the direction that the Democrat Party is going into. Now, keep yeah, in but mind. Steve, but Steve, to Nate's point, uh, the midterms were really not that good to Republicans when it came to turnout. And that a lot of, especially in the suburbs, a lot of voters felt that Trump's messaging and, and how he spoke was was too aggressive or, or offended some people. So aren't you concerned about the midterms? Is that a, the canary in the coal mine for you? Not at all, because that uh, uh, vote turnout, I believe, and many believe, was a backlash against the Republican establishment. Look, there's no way you can transfer votes from one candidate to another. The president is still the, the individual who has kept all his promises. The economy strong. Unemployment rate is down. Look what he's done with criminal justice reform. Look what he's done for the minority community. There are many accomplishments of this president that the mainstream media is not talking about. But believe me. They're making the same mistake. They, the mainstream media and pollsters, while they're looking at the polls, we're out there talking about the pulse of the people. And let me just add one more thing. You look at the cities that are controlled by Democrats, the crime rate is out of hand. Look at Chicago. California is collapsing. Uh, Baltimore is a mess. All these cities with all these troubles are controlled by Democrats. And the people who are Democrats are getting wise to this. Steve, a couple things. One, uh, the Chicago narrative is false because actually the most crime ridden cities are actually in mostly in Republican uh, states such as St. Louis, uh, Mississippi, Biloxi, Jackson, Mississippi, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is also having a current health crisis. So the narrative of Chicago and Democratic leadings and crime going up is actually is actually false. And in major cities, crime is actually at historic lows. And that trend has, has been going consistently since 2006 to 2008. In addition, in reference to the economy, we have for the first time since I believe 2009, the stock market has actually lost value, not gained value for the first for, for the first time in over 12 years. So the economy is not as strong, and there's a lot of signals that are showing that a real estate bubble is on the horizon, and economic numbers are not as strong as people thought, and the tax cuts did not create the jobs that it was promised. How many shootings in those cities you just mentioned, other than Chicago last month? I could tell you how many probably three, four maybe, Chicago, a dozen a week, two dozen a week. So I, I've got to tell you, my friend, with all due respect, uh, you're wrong on that. Okay, guys, 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 okay I want to, we're getting distracted from the Beto conversation because that's what we were here for. So, Nate, I want to go to you because Steve mentioned something that he said that the Democratic Party is moving to the left and, and the rise of Bernie Sanders makes it more socialist in nature. And that's part of what turned off a lot of those Bernie Trump voters. Um, I want to ask about the Connor Lamb model because he was a centrist who uh, he's a Democrat and he was able to pick off enough of those blue collar white voters in Pennsylvania and he won. Um, and when I look at him versus Beto, I, I think that Connor Lamb is more to the middle because I, I looked up the voting record for Beto, for example. Heritage Foundation says he's only got a four percent record for, with them, but he's got a hundred percent with Planned Parenthood, which is a very liberal organization, in my opinion. So, uh, is is there some truth to what Steve's saying that someone like Beto is just too liberal for the whole country? Well, it's funny because he you know, he's being hit for not being progressive enough, and now mm -hmm. he's he's too far you know to the right. Um, I think you know the Connor Lamb model is a good point, though. Because that's really what scares Trump and the Republicans the most is a candidate who can pull away their supporters. And you have to keep in mind, he was deep in Trump country. He won, 
in a very heavily Republican district. We don't need to swing the vote quite as much as he did. I think he, you know, it was like 19 percent was what he had to overcome as far as what Trump's victory in that district was. We need to swing the vote a couple percentage points. That means getting our base out a little bit more, getting young people out a little bit more, bringing over a few Republicans, winning over a few independents. We do that and we will easily win the presidency in 2020. And if you look at a candidate like Beto, he checks all those boxes. Young people love him. They came out in record numbers for him in Texas. The base loves him, progressives love him, and he's so great at connecting with moderates and independents in a way that no other candidate is. And I think that's what makes him the biggest threat to Trump in 2020. And also just to have him out there campaigning, even if he doesn't win the primary, is very beneficial to the, Republic, to the Democratic brand. And it really shows our strength as a party because he's such a strong messenger. The one thing I found interesting is that the Beto O'Rourke train has come out the station, even though he has lost. But why hasn't it, why hasn't there been the same enthusiasm for Andrew Gillum, who came even closer than Beto O'Rourke did, or Stacey Abrams, uh, who ran for governor in Georgia, who came closer than Beto O'Rourke? They were they were in two key states: Georgia, which is turning purple. Uh, Florida, which is always won by point zero zero four percent of the vote every time. So why is it Beto O'Rourke, who had a larger His margin deficit, was two point five percent, which is Five times the loss. <laughs> right. But however, so, so however, there's a food enthusiasm for him, but not for two other candidates that were even closer to winning in probably two key states for 2020. Mm. Yeah, man, this is a great question, a really important point to make. Um, I would certainly love to see either Stacey Abrams or Andrew Gillum run. Um, you know, I think they're, they're both really strong candidates. But with Beto, it's unique because he's been running so aggressively for two years and he's been in the media spotlight for that time as well. Um, he's just so well known nationwide. He's this really unique uh, neighbor condition, where even in Iowa, they're polling voters in Iowa, and he came in third right after Bernie and Joe Biden, who have been, you know, even larger figures for even longer time. Um, something about him just really does inspire and connect with voters in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, and as much as I love Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams, to be honest, I didn't, you know, I personally didn't come across them as much um, on social media in the in the content that went viral. Beto went viral time and time again. He really understands how to tap into that. And that's well, and, and he's also voters. held, he's, he's a congressman, so he's held federal office, and neither uh, Stacey Abrams nor Andrew Gillum have held federal office. Uh, but I guess this begs the question, though, all three of those lost. So wouldn't Trump have, as, as is his style, to say, no matter all three of those, if they run, they're all losers? I mean, how, how, how would Beto O'Rourke overcome that? To say, if he can't even win at the this, uh, U.S. state race, um, how could he win the country? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously that's that would certainly be like, Trump's main talking point. But one thing to remember with Beto is he's just so good at sticking to what matters. He is very mm -hmm. good at talking about the issues people care about, focusing about the larger point he's trying to make and getting past the petty stuff. You know, keep in mind, he ran against the Republicans, arguably their second strongest candidate, you know, a, a nationally and one of their dirtiest candidates as well. Ted Cruz is very. Um, you know, very hard candidates to run against. He's a very dirty team. Uh, they're very talented, but, you know, they, they run a, a tough campaign. And he came out cleaner at the end. He came out more popular. So that yeah, really speaks to his I ability mean, to fight back. He, he did walk away. He tried to walk away from the scene of a DUI. Better our work did. And, and he tried to deny that. But PolitiFact said, um, actually, no, the police report said a witness saw him try to leave the scene of the DUI. And then um, he wrote a, a, a university column for university, uh, Columbia University, that said um, that a woman, uh, her only qualification seem to be her phenomenally large breast and tight buttocks. And he had to walk that back. He had to apologize. So if you're trying to appeal to women and to say that uh, he's more responsible than President Trump, Trump doesn't even drink. Uh, so, so what's the response to those? Yes, but President Trump might not drink, but he grab him by the <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying, no, affairs, just, affairs no, no, on his pregnant I'm just wife. Saying, so we can't, you can't compare the no, two. No, no, I'm just saying. I mean, how how would you respond to that? If you're trying to say he came out cleaner, but he has these questionable things behind him, Trump would certainly use these. He does, but that didn't cost him support in Texas. You know, he was he was upfront about it. He responded. He apologized, and he got back to talking about what matters and what people care about. And that's you know providing better health care. That's you know providing uh, better paying jobs, um, focusing more on infrastructure and improving our immigration system, criminal justice reform. He is really good at communicating the issues that matter to people in a way that's not talking down to them, but still gets them to care about it and understand it. And that's what's so frustrating for Democrats is our policies are popular. We win referendums time and time again in conservative states and conservative areas, but our candidates lose in those areas. But Beto has this unique ability to explain those issues in a way that uh, makes sense to voters and, and inspires them. And it, that's really, you know, unique. We don't see that often. So I think it's something that we need to tap into and get them on the national stage campaigning, 
even if he doesn't win, it's still, like I said, very, very beneficial to the party. Well, and he's young, too. Exactly. So, Steve, uh, we'll give you the last word here before you wrap the segment. Again, what, what's the better strategy for the Trump campaign? Look, at the end of the day, it's going to be the people choosing a socialist agenda or the agenda that has always kept America strong. And those are our conservative values. People are going to vote their pocketbooks. We know that happens all the time. President Trump has uh, cut taxes, cut regulations. He's working on the infrastructure. We have a strong military. Indeed, under President Trump, we are better off than we were four years ago. And we will be much better off after he's reelected and finishes his second term out. All right, we'll see what the voters say. Thank you, Nate and Steve, for this bipartisan conversation. Thank you.